You can spot a senior developer not just by code that he is writing, but by code that he avoids writing. And in the last 15 years I reviewed hundreds of different code bases and I noticed 10 different coding patterns which separates junior from senior. So by the end of this video you will see on the real examples what you should never write in your code if you want to be successful. Point number one are console logs in production. A lot of people are debugging their code, they simply throw console logs here and there while debugging and they don't remove these console logs when they are merging a feature. Obviously, if the pull request is reviewed, people will ask you to remove them. But sometimes these console logs are getting to production, then people can see some data in the console, even sensitive data, like a user information. You won't look like a senior developer if you are not removing console logs from your code. It is extremely simple, just do it. And if you want a written plan which can help you to get to a senior level, I prepared for you a free PDF that you can get in the description. The next point is about magic numbers and hard-coded strings. And the code that you can see here is even on the second level. On the first level you will see just some magic numbers without variables in your code then you can never understand what it is about. Here it is better because we are using variables like discount price, button color, max items in order to understand what we are talking about here. If we just multiply price on something without a variable, we never know what is 085. When we have here a name discount price, it is clear, okay, this is a discounted price. But still it is questionable. Why is that? Because what is 085? Realistically, we can guess this is some factor to reduce the price. But the best approach here would be to first of all store in some constant the 085 and maybe share it across the whole application if we want to apply discounts everywhere. Exactly the same I can say about button colors. We don't want to store strings like this because it is not reusable. You either want to move it to some CSS class and then apply it or at least move to constants and store all your CSS colors in a single place. The same with max items. Obviously we can guess that max items 10 means that we are rendering only 10 items on the screen. But it is not clear. It is much better to create something like a constants helper and then you can input it here and write constants dot items per page. And then it is crystal clear what it is about. And it is shareable across the whole application. The next point is more interesting. It is about mixing your business logic with your rendering logic. And this is exactly what all people are doing in the frameworks like React out of the box. Let's have a look here. We have a typical app component with some data state and we have an API call inside our use effect. So we're getting our sales, we're saving our data and then we use it to calculate some local variables which we render on the screen. This is all great and this is how we typically create our component. Is this component bad? Not really. You might even want to leave it like this, but you must remember that you can always split your business logic from the component. It might not make a lot of sense when your component is small, like 50 lines of code, but if it is bigger, it makes a lot of sense to separate view layer from business layer. Let's have a look on refactored variant. And again, it is not better, it is just different. So here our app component completely separated business logic and view logic and we don't have any business logic here at all. We have a custom hook use sales data where we load some data. Additional to that we have two helper functions which calculate fast local variables. So this component is only a view layer which uses some business logic. Now let's have a look on our business logic. First of all, we have a custom hook, use sales data, which allows us to fetch this data from any component and store them inside state. Additionally, here we have two helpers for filtering sales and calculating total revenue. Most importantly, all these three things can be completely shareable. But even if they are not, you can just write your code like this in a single component. Which brings us to the next point is when our component cares about too much. So here we have our app component where we have user inside, then editing state and from data. 
So we're not only fetching user data in this component, but we also have an input and this save function. So again, we're loading our user and we're rendering two different parts, either editing part or just user information. And this is exactly an example when a single component is doing too much. You might think, okay, we have just 50 lines of code, we can keep it as it is. Obviously, but with time and the amount of code, it might be difficult to support such component when it does different things. Now let's have a look on refactored variant. Here we have our app component, where inside again we have just view layer, and we're rendering inside two things, user form and our user information. On the level of our app, we're using use user hook and is editing state because it belongs here. Now let's have a look on our use user hook. What it does inside, it stores a user and it fetches it by ID. And additionally, it have an update user function, which we also export outside. It allows us to encapsulate everything which is related to working with the user inside this use user hook. Additionally to that, we created user form, which is a child component, and it stores some data locally and creates a user form. Again, we move this code outside of our component, and now our component doesn't do all these things, we separated them. And as we are using TypeScript in almost all projects nowadays, you don't need to use any without a good reason. And in every single project that I am reviewing, I see that people are using hundreds or thousands of any in every single place. Let's have a look on the code. You have a format user function where you are getting the user. Do you know what type is it? No, not really, because you wrote any. And here we are checking first name and last name. Now here we have additionally a function fetch user data from API, which returns for us any, and we throw any inside our function. Obviously this code is really bad, because it uses any, and for developer it is not clear at all what data we are working with. Now let's have a look on the refactored code. And we're starting here by defining our user, which has a first name and a last name. It makes our function format user a breeze, because we understand what data type is coming and what we're returning. I would additionally write here that we're returning a string to make it crystal clear. Now here we're getting a data from the API, and typically this is an unknown data for you, because the format can be whatever. This is why we're writing here not any, but unknown, because we don't know a type yet. But additionally here we're using a helper is user, where inside we're throwing raw data. And what this helper does, it checks that the data type is a user. How it does it? It is checking that we have inside first name and last name, and it means that this is a user, so we're telling TypeScript with is user that it is really a user. Now inside our format user, we are getting raw data user and not any, which is extremely important. In this case, we are using TypeScript correctly, we are not using any, and if we don't know the type of some variable, we are using unknown instead. Another important problem is ternary operators, and this is something that I also like to write from time to time. Using ternary operator on its own is fine, but nested is not great. Let's have a look. We have a status message, and basically in order to avoid creating additional variables, we are throwing everything in a single line. So if we have a loading state, we are returning loading, in other case we are checking do we have an error, and then we are returning error occurred, in other case we are checking data length, and we are returning data not found, or data loaded successfully. Here we have three ternary operators, and it is extremely difficult to read. I would go maximum with two if you have a single line which is easy to read. But here is the code which is much better to read. We have a get status message and inside we are throwing an object which is loading error and data. This is what we are typically getting from some API call. And then we are returning in different if conditions the string that is going to the status. And now we are just using this function without any ternary operators. It makes our code easier to change and to read. The next point is questionably not bad. Why is that? Let's have a look. Here we have our two locale date string that we're using on new date in different places. Like just imagine we have a file user profile and inside we're using it and then another history and comment section. 
A lot of people will say, okay, you are using the same function in all these places, you need to create a helper and share it between these places. Is it really a good idea? I would say no, because first of all, we are using here new date and to locale date string, this is plain JavaScript. It is extremely easy to read and it is not taking a lot of space. Every single time when you are creating a helper, you are creating a problem for yourself that you need to support. In this case, we don't have such problem. So I wouldn't say that this code is bad. But obviously a lot of people would say it is much better to refactor this code and move this function outside. So in utilities you create a function, form a date, where inside you are throwing a date, and then you are importing this helper in every single file and you are using it. Both variants are fine, but I prefer to make helpers only when they are really shareable and not for just a single place where I think that it might be shareable. The next point about writing comments, and some people prefer to write obvious comments, like for example here, what we are doing, we are incrementing i by 1, or here we are checking if user is not logged in. Obviously, it is easier to read English text like this, but I can guess what it is about in the code. If I am seeing if user is not equal now, then show dashboard. I can understand this and it is for me similar to plain English. These comments for me are useless in this case. And here is an example of the comment which is extremely useful. Prevent Safari from bailing out of the input focus after a touch event. Without this, users tapping the input on iOS won't see the keyboard sometimes. And here we have an event listener, touch and focus. Without this comment, we can't understand why we need this code at all. And here we are fixing some specific edge case that we had in our application. This is extremely important comment that I would like to see when I am touching code like this. Another important problem is assuming that API response will always be correct. We like to think only about happy path and we don't cover all the cases. Let's have a look on the code. Here we are just fetching the list of the products and we are rendering them on the screen. Even on such small example, it might be that we are getting some wrong API back. Like for example, our data is null and then our client will break with cannot read map of null. Additionally to that, it might be that inside the entity we don't have a name, maybe it is also null, and then we are not showing anything. Such client is not bulletproof, but we can easily fix this code if we just check before that if we don't have data, then we want to return some markup like no data. So now we are sure that data is there, but maybe name is not there. What we can write additionally is just fallback to not set. In this case our client won't break and we will render a name as not set, and then later we will see that the problem is in API and it must be fixed. But from the client side it is clear first of all for the user, and secondly nobody will say that our client is broken. And if you want to bring it on the next level, you can use things like Zod, which allows you to write schemas for your APIs and make a runtime validation for your data. So by using something like this, product schema, the object, name, you are ensuring that every single product has a name inside. And the last one is ignoring performance when you can just improve it out of the box. For example inside React, we typically want in the component to write inline on click with some function. The main problem of such function is that we are creating it every single time when this component is being rendered. And in this case, it is causing unnecessary renders of this item component. Here is how we can improve this code. First of all, our item list we are wrapping with memo. And what it allows us to do is to skip all renders when our props are unchanged. But here is a problem, our on item click will always be changed because it is a function. This is why as you can see I created a parent with a use callback. And we are wrapping our function on item click with use callback and we are telling that we don't have dependencies for this function. In this case function won't be recreated and then props won't be changed. In this case child component item won't have unnecessary renders. 
But again, you should not just jump from the beginning in improving your rendering if you don't have rendering or performance problems. And don't forget, if you need some help to get to a senior level, I prepared for you a free PDF with the checklist and the 30 days plan to start on improving your skills. You can get it in the description under the video.